peaceful, isn't it? If the game awards are anything to go by, the Pikmin games have long been considered a family-friendly strategy game. But if we rewind just a tad bit, this fragile persona slowly begins to shatter. Yeah, so Pikmin's a survival horror game, where the slightest mistake can cost you dozens, if not hundreds, of casualties. And this isn't a one-time instance either. This happens across different time periods, in different areas, and across multiple games. The question is then, which of these games is the deadliest? To figure this out, I've played through each of these games while looking to record every single Pikmin death I witnessed. To help standardize things, each of these games' stories have been 100%ed. This means that every ship part was collected in Pikmin 1, every treasure was collected in Pikmin 2, every fruit was collected in Pikmin 3, and every treasure was collected in Pikmin 4. This also meant that I 100%ed every area in the game. This included things like Dandori battles or castaways in Pikmin 4. I did not include side mission modes or challenge modes in this video as they vary widely from game to game. Now with all of that out of the way, let's figure out which of these family friendly games is the deadliest. To start, let's go all the way back to 2001, where it all began. The first game starts off by introducing us to Captain Olimar, a married man on an interstellar vacation, one that he didn't see the need to invite his family on. Thankfully this works out for the best as he's hit by a meteorite before crash landing on an unknown planet. This planet will be identified in a later game, but for now it's a mysterious and uncharted frontier. And with Olimar's ship, the SS Dolphin, in pieces, it's up to us to help him collect them all so that he can make his way back home before the release of Pikmin 2. Now upon waking up we find ourselves in the game's first location, fittingly named the Impact Site. We also learn at this point that due to Olimar's composition, he can't stand being on this planet for more than 30 days. The added urgency introduced by this time limit acts as the game's first bit of potential danger and difficulty. While you'd like to take your time, as it's a real-time strategy game after all, you can never be too comfortable with your decisions. After exploring the area a bit, we come across some strange plant-like creatures. As I'm sure all of you know, these are the titular characters, the Pikmin, named due to their likeness to Pik Pik Carrots, a popular brand back on Olimar's home planet of Hokate. It's also here where we learn the mechanics that will take us through the rest of these games. Pikmin can be thrown to attack, carry things, push things, all of which will be essential when looking to escape this dangerous planet. Now after growing enough Pikmin to push this box out of the way, we collect the ship's first part, the engine, allowing us to fly up into orbit during the harsh nights while taking the Pikmin with us. The first day at the impact site has no dangers for us whatsoever, as it acts as the game's tutorial stage. That soon changes though, as the very next day opens up a completely new area, the Forest of Hope, and it's here where we start to learn just how dangerous this planet can be. Upon landing, I have my Pikmin tear up this grass to uncover some nectar. Now this lets the Pikmin bloom into their flower state, which makes them considerably faster. This is particularly crucial as the enemies in Pikmin 1 are pretty tough and unforgiving. So having faster Pikmin often means that they can avoid dangerous situations, more often than not should you make a mistake. Knocking down the wall of the starting area, we come across our first set of enemies, the Dwarf and Adult Bulborb. The Dwarf ones aren't too bad as they can be defeated in one stomp from your Pikmin. The Adults, however, are far more dangerous, often requiring many Pikmin to take them down safely. Should they shake your Pikmin off, there's a good chance they'll eat some. This danger is only further magnified if they're surrounded by dwarf bulbobs, who are primed to eat Pikmin that are shaken off by the adults, as you can see here. As we'll come to see, though, these monsters are the least of our problems on this planet. Now, after clearing out the main area and knocking down another wall, we come across another onion. This one is yellow, though, and sprouts out a different type of Pikmin, the yellow Pikmin. Now, yellow Pikmin have their own strengths and weaknesses. They are weaker than red Pikmin, but can be thrown higher and are the only ones in Pikmin one who can carry bomb rocks. With them, we're able to launch bomb rocks at these solid stone walls. Just make sure you're better at aiming than I am. Psh, look at these dumbasses. For the most part, this area isn't too dangerous. There's certainly dangerous parts to it, like this section with the double adult bulbobs, or the sections of water that can drown Pikmin, especially when you've got AI like this. All in all though, this area is pretty tame, especially compared to the later sections of this game. Speaking of which, after collecting five ship parts, a new area unlocks, the Forest Naval. Now here's where things start to get a bit more serious. This area not only introduces elemental type enemies like the fiery blowhogs, but also every first player's worst nightmare, the Wollywogs. 
These frog creatures are extremely dangerous, able to jump and crush any Pikmin under them. The hardest part about taking these guys out though is having to aim precisely so that Pikmin don't fall off or drop below them while they're mid-jump. These enemies can quickly decimate dozens of Pikmin, especially when paired with other enemies in proximity to them. The forest navel also contains the blue onion, which, yep, you guessed it, holds the blue Pikmin. And these Pikmin can safely walk through water, which is a blessing seeing as a good proportion of this area is covered in just that. Unfortunately, this also means more frogs. By this point though, I had figured it best to just throw a few on and call them back immediately should they fall off. This result resulted in fewer casualties altogether. Now after clearing out most of the area and collecting numerous ship parts, it was time to take on the mini boss of this area. Yes, this game has bosses. But before that, I should point out that it's important to pay attention to every group of Pikmin, even while you're not with them. As you can see here, I lost around 50 Pikmin as they were carrying something back to the base. I had no idea where or how they died. They just seemingly vanished out of nowhere. Even if you believe you've cleared out the whole area, you can never be too sure in this game. Back to the mini boss though, after blowing up this stone wall you're greeted with a somewhat small rounded arena. Moving towards the center of it will spawn the BD Bong Legs, a lanky spider-like enemy that stomps around crushing any Pikmin under it. Now if you've taken red or blue Pikmin, you'll soon realize that due to this guy being at least 6 foot, yellow Pikmin are your best bet at taking him down. Even so, he's still very scary. He stomps constantly and any Pikmin thrown that misses core are in grave danger of being crushed. It's advised to take a smaller group than I did, as having this many Pikmin around often results in unneeded casualties while trying to maneuver around his stomps. With the BD long legs defeated though, we can travel back to the Forest of Hope and relax. All right. Never mind. Let me introduce you to the Burrowing Snagrets, one of the most annoying enemies in any Pikmin game. They can't completely wipe out a whole army of Pikmin in one fell swoop, but their long arching necks make it extremely hard to throw Pikmin onto them. This paired with the fact that they usually appear in groups makes it even worse. The fact that they hide on the ground and burrow out to surprise you when you least expect it often results in numerous deaths your first time around. Now the Forest of Hope has one last boss creature, that being the Armored Cannon Beetle. And while this one may look very intimidating, he's not nearly as dangerous as the the others we've covered so far, as one quick Pikmin throw is all that's required to clog his hole before you pile onto his ass. With all the boss creatures cleared out of this area, we can now finish collecting up all the ship parts in both the Forest of Hope as well as the Forest Naval, all while losing some more Pikmin to the f***ing frogs again. After collecting 12 ship parts, the fourth area of this game opens up. In this place, makes even the Forest Naval look like heaven. Straight off the bat, this place is surrounded by water, making management of multiple Pikmin types a necessity. Many of the game's toughest enemies find refuge in this area. You've got spotted bull bears, which are more aggressive and can eat more Pikmin than your regular bull bobs, yellow wally hops, who aren't as dangerous as wally wogs, but are often found in water, limiting which Pikmin types you can effectively use, and plenty of swooping snitch bugs that are just plain annoying, especially when dealing with other tough enemies. Now these may seem manageable for the most part, and they honestly are, but I have purposely avoided mentioning the true horror that rests here. Should you arrive in this area before the 16th day and happen upon this large egg, then prepare yourself for mass extinction. The monstrosity that pops out of this egg is called the Smoky Prog, and if his appearance isn't haunting enough, the miasma of gloom that instantly kills Pikmin, should they touch it, should be. This is arguably the most dangerous enemy in the entire game. You must be extremely careful when throwing Pikmin towards it, as one wrong move and they will instantly wilt away. It becomes even worse if, like me, you didn't clear out the area properly, and now you have swooping snitch bugs, snatching your Pikmin, you have yellow wally hops jumping around fucking with you, and maybe even a spotted bull bear if you're really that unlucky. By the end of day 14, I'd lost a staggering 114 Pikmin, the most lethal day yet. Even so, I had barely touched the distant springs, and going back into it was just as brutal. Each day I'd lose Pikmin to spotted bull bears, yellow wally hops, and even some to another armored cannon beetle. This area becomes even more dangerous as the days pass as well, with dwarf bull bears appearing after the 15th day, as well as more sweeping snitch bugs and puffy blowhogs. The water itself may not seem as dangerous now that we have blue Pikmin, but there are a few narrow ledges that you need to be extremely careful on, as well as plenty of puffy blowhogs that will do anything they can to blow your red and yellow Pikmin straight into the water. This area became a graveyard for Pikmin during my playthrough. Even so, I fought my way through, and after collecting every single ship piece in the area, it was time to go back to the impact site to collect the penultimate part. Now while the impact site was harmless the first day, it most certainly isn't this time around. The main reason being this gooey fucker, the Ghoulix. Now as you can probably tell from watching my dumbass throw yellow Pikmin into it, this guy is made of water, meaning the only Pikmin capable of destroying it are blue Pikmin. In saying this, once you do take him on with blue Pikmin, he isn't dangerous at all. The enemy holding the ship part, on the other hand. Oh, you gluttonous motherfucker. Yeah. So this asshole decided to lodge a part of my ship in his mouth, and if that didn't fill him up enough, he still wants to eat any Pikmin I throw in there. The worst part is, even after dislodging the ship part, he still can chomp down. 
Dude, are you f***ing serious? How are you still munching? Regardless, with 29 of the 30 ship parts collected, it was time to make our way towards the final area, fittingly named the Final Trial. This area is a small one that challenges players with numerous challenges, that will test their knowledge surrounding Pikmin management and type usage. The final arena houses the game's final boss, the Emperor Bullblacks. As you can probably tell based on my first attempt, this guy is seriously dangerous. Unlike his fellow grub dogs, his back is completely impervious to damage, meaning you must stand within his attack window at all times and throw Pikmin straight onto his face. His tongue and jump attacks can take out dozens of Pikmin at once, making even one mistake extremely disastrous. You can make this significantly easier by going around the back and collecting some bomb rocks and having him swallow them. Should the Emperor swallow these, they'll explode doing a good chunk of damage and giving you a brief moment to throw some Pikmin onto him. But if you've watched my videos before, you'll know I'm a bit of a dumbass and wanted to try Try things the hard way. Safe to say, I lost a ton of Pikmin, and I mean a ton of Pikmin fighting this guy. With all that said and done though, I did eventually take him out. Upon his defeat, he spews out the final ship part, the secret safe, and with that, we have fully repaired the SS Dolphin. We say goodbye to the Pikmin one last time before taking off into space once again. Destination? Hockate. At the end of it all, I lost a total of 625 Pikmin during this 20 day vacation. Now this may seem like a lot, but remember, this is only the first of four adventures, and if this one's anything to go off, I'm sure there are even more dangers awaiting us. Now after sacrificing over 600 Pikmin for his own benefit, Olimar finally makes it back to his home planet of Hokate. This means that he can finally go and catch up with his family. Anyway, with the company he works for now in debt and his ship sold off, it's up to Olimar to venture back to that mysterious planet, as the treasures found on it sell for a pretty decent amount. This time around we're accompanied by a turd called Louis, and if you're unsure as to why I described him in such an intimate way, well, you'll find out soon enough. On the descent towards the planet, we hit a tree losing Louis in the process. Good riddance if you ask me, but as this is a family friendly game, I guess we will have to go and rescue him. It's here where we're introduced to the fact that you can multitask in this game, meaning you can set separate your forces and get twice as much done, theoretically. Now just like the first Pikmin game, we once again come face to face with the red Pikmin first, and using them we are able to clear out a few dwarf bullborbs, as well as an adult bullborb who has significantly less HP in this game. Now most enemies in this game actually follow this trend to some degree, sometimes having half the HP of their original counterparts. Now while this sounds like it did make the game far safer, that couldn't be further from the truth. The main reason being these things, the caves. These underground passages contain some of the most dangerous and ruthless enemies in the entire series. Pairing that with the fact that there's almost no way to restock your Pikmin once in a cave means that you not only have to play extremely cautiously, but even the weakest, most simplest enemies ever can be extremely devastating. The first of these caves is the Emergence Cave, which somewhat acts as the tutorial for them, and outside of a few bullborbs, there aren't too many dangers in here. In fact, it's in this very cave where you meet the purple Pikmin, who are widely considered one of the best if not the best Pikmin type across the games. They can carry 10 times the weight of a regular Pikmin and are extremely strong, pounding the ground after being thrown. After retrieving the spherical atlas found in the emergence cave, we gain access to the awakening wood. This area houses its own group of enemies, mainly ones that surprise you by popping out of the ground. The burrowing snaggerit makes a reappearance, but alongside them are also the cloaking burrow nip that can pierce Pikmin with its nose, as well as a creeping chrysanthemum that disguises itself as flowers before popping out to surprise unsuspecting players. These can be dangerous at first, but once you learn of their existence, they're not too bad to take down. Making our way through the awakening woods, we come across the first cave in this area, the Hole of Beasts. The sublevels themselves aren't necessarily dangerous, but this hole features the very first boss of the game, the Emperor Bullblacks. At this point she isn't too threatening, merely rolling side to side, but she does instantly crush and kill any pigment under her, so some care is needed. We move from one cave to another, this time entering the White Flower Garden. Much like the Hole of Beasts, this cave is simple with a boss awaiting us at the end. Additionally though, this hole also contains a new pigment type, these being the white pigment. Not only are they extremely agile, but they're also immune to poison and will often kill or damage enemies that consume them. The boss at the bottom of this cave is the burrowing snaggerit. Remember him? He's still just as annoying, but most definitely not the most dangerous. At this point, I had found the geographic projection from the awakened woods and ventured forth to the third area of the game, the perplexing pool. As you can probably tell from its name, yes, this area is full of water. And guess what? We don't have access to the blue pigment just yet, so I guess we're screwed. 
screwed, right? Well, not exactly. We can find our way to the yellow Pikmin, which can then be used to break down the electrical wall that was blocking our path to get to the blue Pikmin. Getting to the yellow Pikmin is easier said than done, however, as you'll most likely have to deal with more yellow Wally Hops, as well as the daunting fiery Ball Blacks, which not only is significantly tankier and lethal than a regular Ball Worm, but also has a fiery back, making him impervious to many forms of Pikmin. Clearing him out grants us access to the yellow Pikmin, and like I said, we can use them to break down the wall in Awakening Wood, allowing us to finally meet with the blue Pikmin. It was also at this point that I realised that this game doesn't care if you're in a cutscene. Wait, what the f***? With blue Pikmin unlocked, we can now start collecting all the treasures scattered around the different areas. I started by going back to the Valley of Repose, the area where we first landed, and while the enemies above ground proved to be complete jokes, the creatures hidden beneath continued to humble me. This is the subterranean complex, which essentially acts as an active land minefield. Bombs drop from the ceiling, you have volatile dweevils, which are essentially the same bombs, but this time they have legs, and if you weren't having enough fun just yet, there's also careening deary bugs that, yep, you guessed it, drop more bombs. The greatest danger lies at the very bottom though. This is the Man at Lakes, a mechanised version of the other Arachnorb bosses. This one comes with a mountain machine gun though, that instantly kills any Pikmin that he hits. The idea here is to take cover when it's firing, but if you're like me and had no memory of this boss before coming into it, or it's your first time, you most likely panic and start running around in circles, losing dozens of Pikmin in the process. All these challenges make it one of the most dangerous caves we've delved into so far. Now while I say that, by this point, my death counts for Pikmin 1 and Pikmin 2 were actually identical. So you may be thinking that Pikmin 2 is relatively similar, at least in terms of its challenge. Well, as I'm sure anyone that's played these games can tell you, what awaits you in the second half of this game not only ups the difficulty, but also traumatizes you for life. Day 14, I enter the shower room cave, which features more volatile dweevils, plenty of wollywogs, and sometimes both at the same time. The concerning thing about this cave is making sure you don't lose too many blue Pikmin, as there's a lot of treasures submerged in the water that will require them. Thankfully, the boss of this cave isn't particularly dangerous. Day 15, I enter the Snagrit's Hole, and while the sublevels aren't that dangerous, the boss of this place can be a real pain in the ass. Just like the normal Snagrits, this guy's head may as well be in orbit. And if that wasn't bad enough, this guy also jumps around, making it extremely hard to precisely aim onto his head. Day 16, I entered the submerged castle, and if you know, you know. This cave only has five sublevels, which compared to the rest is very short. The real danger here isn't the length though. Rather, it's an entity that still terrorizes my dreams, even after all these years. And just like that, the Pikmin series has morphed from a family-friendly strategy game into a full-on survival horror. This nightmare not only hunts you down throughout each sublevel, but he's impervious to any damage source until the final floor. That paired with this slightly bleak yet unnerving soundtrack make for an extremely uncomfortable and anxiety-inducing experience. His concrete rollers instantly kill any Pikmin they roll over, and he's large enough to take up most of the narrow corridors. Truly a nightmarish creature, and one of the most dangerous in the whole Pikmin franchise. I must say, the euphoric feeling you get when you finally get to turn the tables and bully the water wraith on the final floor makes going through that traumatic experience worth it. Now after finishing up these caves and collecting a few more treasures above ground, I'd officially plundered enough to pay off $10,000 debt, set at the start of the game. With that, we can finally fly off back to Hokate. But hold on, where's Louis? Arriving back on Hokate, the president of the company tells us if we wish we can go back and rescue Louis, as he's most likely been caught by some creature. At the start of the video, I did say I would 100% the stories of each of these games, to make it a fair comparison. So with that in mind, it's time to go back to that dreaded planet. Now I'd completed a large portion of each of the zones by this point. Thankfully after paying off the debt, the planet opens up with another area. We'll get to this one soon enough, but first let's finish collecting the rest of the treasures, as well as go through the last cave, the Frontier Cavern. Now this cave started off well until about sub-level 7, where... Yeah, this level is a nightmare to run through with a lot of Pikmin. The final boss as well can be quite lethal if you're unaware of what it's going to be like. It's the same Empress Bolblex you fought at the very beginning, but this time she shoots lava out of her ass. Now these things, while seemingly weak, are extremely fast and can munch through armies of Pikmin at light speeds. After losing more Pikmin than I'd like to admit, I decided to leave Olimar at the back to deal with the lava, while I fought the Empress from the front as normal. This cave turned out to be one of the most dangerous ones I'd delved into so far. The next few days just involved me collecting any leftover treasures from the three starting areas. I lost a few Pikmin here and there to stupid mistakes, but nothing really that significant. From here, we venture into the last area of the game, the Wistful Wild. Now the area itself isn't particularly large, but it's full of dangerous enemies, many of which are bunched together in close proximity. The true dangers, like the majority of Pikmin 2, lies below though, in the area's three caves. The first of which being the Cavern of Chaos. 
Wait, wait, what? I, I literally just spawned. As I was saying, the first of these is the Cavern of Chaos. Honestly, this cave was extremely annoying. Almost every sublevel had one annoying thing planted in it. The first level has extremely narrow paths, so it's a good thing the airspace is crowded with careening jerry bugs. The second floor has three fiery ball blexes, which all have a treasure inside them. Like, come on, you couldn't just make two of them have treasures? So you better make sure you've got enough red Pikmin, otherwise you'll be in a whole world of hurt. Coming into level four, you want to save these bomb rocks. Um, just ignore what I'm doing. This floor has two Emperor Bowl Blacks, and these bomb rocks will make dealing with them extremely easy. Or you could just do it the painful way like I ended up doing and lose a bunch of Pikmin in the process. Honestly, from start to finish, this cave was beating my ass. The sublevels weren't dangerous enough, the cave ends with the segmented Krobster, who is a nightmare to deal with if you're running around with a ton of Pikmin. His roll attack instantly kills any Pikmin he squishes, and if that wasn't bad enough, when he collides with the walls it causes a rain of boulders to fall from the ceiling, which once again is hard to avoid with a large group of Pikmin, especially if they aren't fully bloomed into flowers. Things aren't looking too great for this area, this is only the first of the three caves. Speaking of those other two, the first I tackled was the Hall of Heroes. I honestly consider this the hardest cave in the game, and probably the entire franchise. It's essentially a boss rush, it starts off alright, but by the fourth floor you're once again having to deal with this long necked arsehole. Floor 7 has you rematch against this water based lawnmower, except this time you have a ton of armoured cannon beetles then littering the arena, oftentimes causing many of your Pikmin to be caught in the crossfire. Essentially every boss encounter is just a more dangerous version of the original. Floor 9 has every single bull bulb, including a spotty bull bear that sits at the gate waiting for your Pikmin to destroy it. And then we come to floor 13, and look who it is, it's the fucking man at Legs, except this time he's surrounded by water. So guess we're using blue Pikmin here. Thankfully I learned to use cover to block this attack. Okay, maybe I didn't. Thankfully the final boss of this cave isn't too bad, it's just a chunkier version of the beady long legs from the floor before. Using a small group of Pikmin here should give you safe passage to its treasure. With those two caves looted and the rest of the treasure up top cleaned up, it was finally time to delve deep into the final cave, the Dream Den. As this is often considered the final cave, you'd expect it to be the most dangerous and while I believe it's slightly better than the Hall of Heroes, it's definitely no cakewalk. Every sublevel of this place is loaded with dangerous enemies, from bull orbs to armoured cats cannon beetles to dweevils and aerial fuckers. Essentially the developers just decided to copy and paste a bunch of enemies into tiny arenas, making it extremely difficult to maneuver around properly. The worst of these is without a doubt sub level 10 though. The level layout here is just pure trash. Not only do you start on a tiny platform surrounded by water, but you're more than likely to have a Gatling Gronk or Wollywog spawn so close to you that you're immediately trying to avoid it, often meaning your Pikmin are going to fall in the water and start drowning. It's honestly a clusterfuck of a floor, and the likelihood of it killing runs is extremely high. Once we find our way to the very bottom, we finally find that little weasel, Louis. While he might seem out of it, he's sitting atop the final boss of the game, the Titan Dweevil. This monster can be extremely dangerous as he wields all four elements, one of which can instantly kill your Pikmin. I did remember my dad teaching me how to fight this thing when I was a kid though, so I just used purely yellow Pikmin, as they not only reached every weapon in the game pretty easily, but also are immune to the one elemental attack that instantly kills you. It takes a long time, but it's not nearly as dangerous when you go about it this way. After an eternity though, I finally destroyed it and claimed the last of the treasures as well as Louis. With Louis rescued, we can finally say goodbye to the Pikmin once again and make our way back to Hokate. For those still paying attention, you can probably see the damage Pikmin 2 inflicted. By the end of it, I had lost a whopping 932 total Pikmin, making it a far more dangerous game than the original. With two games remaining though, the question remains, are they more dangerous than Pikmin 2? Here is where we start to branch out in terms of the story, as we're no longer following Olimar. Instead, we start on the planet of Kulpai, as we learn about their impending extinction due to a shortage of food. To save their people, unmanned scout vessels are sent out into space in hopes of finding some kind of food. One of these vessels happens upon a planet that seems to contain traces of food, and as such, three intergalactic explorers are sent off to investigate this planet, now dubbed PNF-404. But in usual Pikmin fashion, their ship explodes into three separate parts. It's here where we meet with the first of these three explorers. Charlie. And if you haven't guessed it yet, the planet now called PNF-404 just so happens to be the same planet Olimar and Louis had ventured through before, as we discover the yellow Pikmin. Now we play as Charlie for a little while, just learning some of the basic mechanics again before he gets jumped by an unknown entity. We're then sent over to ALF. I think we can all guess based on where he starts what Pikmin he'll discover. Yep, red Pikmin. Wait, wait what? But he started in 
water. From here, the usual tutorial plays out in full, where it teaches the player how to control and use the Pikmin. There are a few useful additions introduced in this game that'll make things far easier. Those being the fact that you can now lock onto targets, and now you can send your Pikmin into a charge state, which essentially results in a short burst of damage that can essentially kill most enemies, granted you have enough Pikmin charging them. After a while, we get a call from the third and final member, Brittany, who seems to be stranded in a completely different area. The next day we fly over to Australia, and though you can't convince me that's not Australia, I live here, to rescue Brittany. The treasure to collect this time around is fruit, which not only acts as a mechanism to drive the story forward, but also as a gameplay mechanism, as the fruit itself gets turned into juice that's consumed at the end of each day. Just like the original Pikmin, this means there's a time limit on your activities, but as we'll find out, it may as well not exist at all. Now the journey towards Brittany isn't too dangerous with a few enemies we've encountered in previous games. We also meet the rock Pikmin, which are not only durable, but can also shatter glass. I should point out that in this game, certain enemies have been significantly nerfed. The blowhogs, for example, now don't throw Pikmin quite as far, meaning there's less of a chance to get launched into water or other elemental disasters. There's also more immunity towards certain attacks, like the yellow Wally Hops, who used to be a somewhat dangerous enemy, but are now complete jokes because they cannot crush rock Pikmin, for example. Small changes like these are littered throughout the game and probably foreshadows how dangerous it truly can be. We end up rescuing Brittany and collecting a few more fruit, and before you know it, we've stumbled across the first boss. Now the armored Mordad may look intimidating, but he's actually very easy to take down. His charge attack is very slow and easy to avoid, and his weaknesses are extremely obvious. He may be one of the easiest bosses in the entire franchise, if I'm being honest. The following day, we venture to the distant tundra in hopes of finding out what happened to the captain during the tutorial. The only dangerous enemies in this sequence are probably the arctic cannon lava, but as you can see in this demonstration, the charge mechanic is just completely broken. By this point, I still hadn't lost a single Pikmin. To help put that into perspective, this is how many I had lost so far in the previous two games. Unfortunately, it was around this time that I had lost my first Pikmin, and to a f***ing leaf at that. We eventually stumble into the cave arena where the captain went missing, and it's here where we meet with the monster that took him, the Venomoth Fozbat. This guy looks absolutely terrifying. I'm sure he's going to be extremely dangerous. Oh, he's dead. Well, so far the bosses in this game have been extremely tame in comparison to the ones found in the first two games. Day 6 pass with no casualties, as well as Day 7. These massive bug-eyed crawmads are treated as mini-bosses in this game, but the lock-on system makes them extremely easy to take down, as you can latch your Pikmin onto their eyes before they even get a chance to attack. Honestly, there was so little to threaten me and my Pikmin in these areas that I started losing it, first by leaving some behind, and then again by blowing another 20 or so up with a bomb the next day. <laughs> Oh, I can't believe that just happened. The combination of being able to bum rush enemies down as well as being able to lock onto specific weak points made most enemies in the game feel extremely weak. On day 11, I killed Mr. Shaggy Longlegs without much trouble, and by day 12, I was facing off against the third boss of the game, the Sand Belching Mere Slug. By this point, it should be very obvious that Pikmin 3 and especially Pikmin 3 Deluxe, which is the version I'm playing on currently, were made with a beginner's perspective in mind. Given it was the first Pikmin game to come out in over nine years, Nintendo knew it was going to be an introductory period for a lot of players into the franchise, and as such, left all these little helpful tips scattered around the areas. Problem is, is that they pretty much spell out every single weakness of each boss before you even have to fight them. And do you want to know the weakness of every boss in the Pikmin franchise? Prior knowledge. So with that in mind, we filled up the mere slugs intestines with bomb rocks and took them out without a sweat. With the folded data glutton acquired, we can now gain access to the fourth area, the Twilight River. Surely this must be a dangerous area, right? Well, in comparison to the others, I mean, yeah, you could say so. But in the grand scheme of things, it's definitely nowhere near the worst. This area introduces us to the winged Pikmin, which can, well, fly. No shit. Making the dangers of water even more obsolete, as these little cuties can just glide and carry treasures across it. We end up getting another call, this time though from a familiar face, a very punchable face at that. But alas, I guess we have to go rescue this fucker once again. The main enemies to look out for in this area, especially with regards to your winged Pikmin, are these spiders and their webs. Any Pikmin that are caught in these webs are extremely likely to die. Even with the lock-on feature, these spiders can be pretty nimble or just be out of range, causing you to miss your throws and have Pikmin gobbled up by them. Eventually, we made our way to the top of this tree though, where we find Louis being held by the Scornet Maestro. This guy is surrounded by Scornets, who are fairly deadly should they capture your Pikmin. Using the newly added dodge feature makes this fight a lot simpler, and honestly, if I knew what the hell I was doing, this boss's world wouldn't be nearly as dangerous. With Olimar, I say in quotation marks because obviously it's not 
It's not Olimar. We return back to relax for the night, only to be woken up by an explosion before realizing that Weasel stole all of our juice. This is probably the only section in the game where a time limit is set, because if you don't find any fruit by the next day, well, I guess you're dead. Thankfully, he blows up the wall that originally impeded us, which not only opens us up to a completely new area, but also allows us to finally meet with the blue Pikmin. Using them, we can quickly snag a ton of fruit in this new area. And while water-based enemies tended to be some of the most dangerous enemies in previous Pikmin games, the ones presented here are extremely weak or have very obvious and exploitable weaknesses. Now I say this, but enemies like the peckish Aristocrab, who prance around in water while having weaknesses that require the use of Pikmin that can't swim, can be extremely dangerous, as you can see here. Other tough enemies on the other hand. Yeah, I remember when these guys were extremely dangerous. Charge is just too broken. Coming into day 21, I faced off against the most lethal enemy so far, the Shaggy Longlegs. Like the rest of this guy's family, this guy just stomps around squashing any Pikmin in sight. And despite me having killed plenty of his kind before, this one really just tested my patience. He spends half the time in the water, meaning it's better to just use blue Pikmin instead of yellows. But I swear this guy would pretend to stand still before moving again, causing me to run in too soon and lose a ton of Pikmin to his stomps. By this point though, we were essentially at the end of the game. The next few days saw me facing off against the most dangerous creatures this game had to offer. The first of them was the Calcified Crushblat, who is completely harmless if you only use Use rock Pikmin. Remember what I told you was an enemy's greatest weakness in this franchise? Prior knowledge. And as you can probably tell, I had none of that when fighting this thing. Following this, we finally caught up with Louis, who was once again atop another beast. In all honesty, the coggled Myclops is probably on the tougher end of Pikmin 3 bosses. His stomp attacks are somewhat dangerous, but his most lethal attack is for sure his tongue attack, which can instantly pick up and consume dozens of Pikmin. Because of the state of his arena, I opted to use mainly winged Pikmin, as they can avoid the water that appears after each stomp. After he topples over, it shouldn't take too many charge attacks to burst him down, especially with ultra spicy spray. As long as you look out for his tongue attack, he can be beaten in a fairly simple and safe fashion. With Louis captured once again, we can finish collecting the rest of the fruit in the rest of the areas before making our way to the Eye of the Storm, also known as the Formidable Oak. It's here where we finally get a hold of Olimar, or at least momentarily before this strange entity tries to gobble him up. The rest of this area plays out like a puzzle, where you must guide Olimar with Brittany through multiple obstacles, all while avoiding this mysterious life form known as the Plasm Wraith. I remember this being quite challenging my first time through. It's a lot easier once you realize you can just switch to Brittany and have her do laps around the starting area the whole time, while you craft out a pathway forward with the other two captains. Even with prior knowledge though, it can get pretty dicey if you're not paying attention, and the potential to lose Pikmin can get fairly high towards the latter areas. I managed to transport Olimar to the ship just as the day ended, meaning I would have to return to fight the Pleasant Wraith head on the next day. The boss fight itself remains one of the best in the entire franchise in my opinion. Just like Aang, this guy has control over all the elements, often fusing them with his attacks to make them even more deadly. This fight tests your Pikmin management skills like no other, having to separate and send the correct types to deal with each of its cores. While you're managing this, you must also avoid the race main multi-pierce attack that's extremely deadly to all Pikmin types apart from the rock Pikmin, which is why you can see me using them primarily to do the damage to the main body, while I save the others for more of his elements attack. It's a great fight, and honestly is one of the most dangerous in the entire franchise, especially if it's your first rodeo. With the Plasm Wraith defeated and Olima rescued, we set off into space one last time. Heralded as the new heroes of Kopai, we have once again saved the day and brought new life to our home planet. At the end of Pikmin 3, I had lost a total of 232 Pikmin, a significantly smaller number when compared to the first two games. A good few of these were to my own stupid errors and self-destructs as well. The enemies being significantly weaker, the bosses having easily exploitable weaknesses that are told to the player before beforehand, as well as the newer quality of life mechanics such as lock-on and charge features all play a role in why this Pikmin game is significantly easier, or safer I should say, for the cute little inhabitants of PNF 404. And with that, we're down to our last game. Let's see what PNF 404 has in store for us this time around. Now Pikmin 4 is an interesting game, at least in terms of its story. As we'll cover, it essentially overwrites what happens in the original Pikmin, by way of telling a branching story or maybe even what played out in an alternative universe. We land in someone's home as Olimar, now accompanied by a space dog. Exploring through this area, we learn about the new additions added to this game. A lot of these revolve around your new space pup or dog companion. They themselves can charge, destroying and knocking certain objects down. Pikmin can now ride on top of them, and they can even be switched to you to act as a secondary leader. You've 
eventually do get the ability to upgrade and learn new abilities, but for now those are the important ones to touch on. After a while we come across the first enemy of the game, a poor Quillian. These guys shoot off spikes and will damage anyone that collides with the spikes still attached to them. The idea, as this tutorial demonstrates, is to avoid his attacks before charging down. I think you can already tell just how OP this charge ability is going to become, as well as the other movement capabilities of these space dogs. We take back the interstellar radio, which Olimar uses to signal for help, and it's at this point where we come into play as the rescue corpse. Look, I tried uh, making him look really cool and all, but uh, I think it's a lost cause. With the most incompetent explorer to ever exist created, we start our adventures at the rescue command post with our new pup companion, Ochi. As is the case with most of these games, we meet with the red pigment first, and with their help, we to restore power to the ship. From here, we can travel over to the first area of the game, the Sunspect Terrace. This area is filled with your typical beginner enemies like bull borbs, blowhogs, and shear grubs. Now, throughout these Pikmin 4 areas, there are numerous numerous caves, like the ones you find in Pikmin 2. Unlike Pikmin 2 though, these are much shorter in length, and half the time feature no dangers whatsoever in them, acting more like puzzles to solve. Speaking of puzzles, this game also introduced both Dandori battles and Dandori challenges. Now I won't be including these in the main count, mainly because they don't actually track Pikmin deaths, almost as if they're in a completely different dimension. By the fourth day, I had rescued Roos, the material engineer, meaning I could use the materials I had collected to buy equipment or upgrades. You can also upgrade Ochi's abilities, but we'll discuss those a bit later. I mention these things because, as you can imagine, they are extremely convenient and make things far simpler, especially when it comes to dealing with potentially dangerous creatures. By day seven, I had lost zero Pikmin, which, believe it or not, was even better than my adventures through Pikmin 3. Ochi, by this point, could swim, making blue Pikmin even more obsolete. And even if Ochi couldn't swim, the new ice Pikmin Pikmin can just freeze the water. So, I mean, sometimes you have to wonder why blue Pikmin still exist. The first roadblock for me came in the Kingdom of Beasts, which was a minefield of bulborbs. The Empress Bullblax once again makes an appearance, this time without lava or rocks though. With Ochi's charge ability, she isn't too much of a problem. Her husband, or should I say husbands, on the other hand, fisted me. Their new scream that sends Pikmin into a panic is very dangerous. Not only does it send Pikmin into a random spree, making them easy pickings for their tongues, but it also wakes up any other creatures in their proximity. In this case, it was the second emperor. I lost a significant number of Pikmin to these two, and just like that, any chance of a deathless run completely subsided. Thankfully, the next few days didn't prove to be all that challenging. On day 8, I discovered the blue Pikmin, ventured into the secluded courtyard, learnt that electricity isn't even a one-shot kill anymore, and even fought the final boss of this cave in the least ideal way possible without losing any Pikmin. The fact that every elemental type of damage now allows you to whistle your Pikmin to safety makes them significantly easier to deal with than in previous games. Day 11, I had my first experience with the Night Expedition, which are essentially tower defense missions where you hold off against waves of enemies with the help of the newly discovered Glow Pikmin. Again, I won't be counting these as part of the total death count because they too don't appear to be tracked. By day 13, I was on to the third area, the Serene Shores. As you can probably tell from its name, this is the designated water area of this game. But as we've discussed throughout this video, water with each passing game becomes less and less of a hazard, and more of an annoyance really. The area itself features some dangerous foes however, like the Crusted Rum Pup, who can be difficult to manoeuvre around at first, and has a lethal charge, as well as the numerous water-based enemies that require the use of the weaker Blue Pikmin. Don't get me wrong, Pikmin 4 has by far the most enemies. By this point though, a lot of them are simple enough to deal with, and the number of tools given to players far outweigh the dangers that they pose. A lot of the boss or mini boss enemies this time around are just larger variants of the regular enemies. Bull Bulborbs? Well, what about Jumbo Bull Bulborbs? Blowhogs? Well, better make them bigger into Titan Blowhogs. Yellow Wally Hops? I think you mean the Master Hop. Problem is that none of these versions are actually harder. In fact, they're almost easier because they have such a large surface area that it's almost impossible to miss colliding with them using Ochi. Your Pikmin will almost always instantly destroy these bosses or mini bosses once they make contact after a charge as well. A more veiled example of this tendency to make bosses far weaker in this game comes to light when entering the engulfed castle. As I'm sure you can tell from the previous pictures, we're about to catch up with an old friend. As he did in Pikmin 2, the Water Wraith will continuously hunt you down during the sub-levels of the engulfed castle. Thing is, th this time you can actually outrun him completely with Ochi, or even weave past him if you're feeling a bit spicy. Because Pikmin ride on the top of Ochi, it means that there's pretty much a 0% chance any can get crushed from fanning out if they were running behind you. This and the fact that his HP hasn't changed at all goes to show that even some of the most haunting enemies have become complete pushovers in Pikmin 4. From here, I finished collecting the rest of the treasures, sprawled around Serene Shores, and headed over to the Hero's Hideaway. This area may seem familiar, and that's because it's the same exact location that the game began in. Whilst the guard dog patrols 
controls this area, and while he himself isn't dangerous, he can be pretty annoying and certainly make things harder by running off with your Pikmin. The general layout of this area may be far more complex than the others, but in terms of surface level dangers, there's really not that many. The caves, however, do up the challenge a bit. A good example of this is the Frozen Inferno, which can be kind of tricky. The game recommends you take only red Pikmin, this being because a lot of the gimmicks in this cave involve carrying around fire starters to melt and burn obstacles and enemies. By the second floor though, the cave shifts its themes to a frozen part, and suddenly all the enemies are frosty types. While you can use fire starters, it's a lot more inconvenient than if you'd just brought ice Pikmin to begin with. The Snowflake Flutter Tail who acts as the final boss of this cave is honestly a pretty cool find. I wouldn't say it's necessarily dangerous though, as it's easy enough to keep it out of its ice cocoon and burst it down in a few combos. Now due to these caves feeling far easier than the previous ones in Pikmin 2, I was interested in the comparison and differences between them, so I ran some numbers. For those interested, there are 14 caves in Pikmin 2, while there are 23 in Pikmin 4, a significantly higher number. Yet despite this discrepancy, Pikmin 2 has more total levels to track, totaling 105 to Pikmin 4's 92. This means that the average number of sublevels per cave were 7.5 in Pikmin 2, and only 4 in Pikmin 4, which honestly would have been much lower if it wasn't for one cave in particular that we'll discuss shortly. Pikmin 2's sublevels are also randomly generated and focus on combat and survivability, whereas Pikmin 4 caves follow a fixed format and are more centered around puzzle solving. Basically what I'm trying to say is Pikmin 4 caves feel like tutorial levels compared to Pikmin 2's. Now after collecting all the treasures in the hero's hideaway, we are finally given the chance to battle against a mysterious castaway that everyone somehow knows is Olimar. Defeating him in a Dandori battle allows us to take him back to the command post in Kurum. Doing so triggers the first ending where we fly off once again into space never to return. So we're back the very next day, this time to find a cure for Ochi, as he seemingly can't leave the planet. In order to develop this cure though, we'll need the help of a few other castaways, and more specifically Nell. Problem is, Nell's signal isn't coming from any of the zones we've explored so far, and it's here where we get to explore the vast post-game of Pikmin 4. To start, we find ourselves in the Giant's Hearth, a campfire zone that houses some of the most dangerous enemies the game has to offer. I'm talking spotty bull bears, fiery bull blacks, and even a sovereign bull blacks, which are even larger variants of the Emperor Ball Blacks, with even more lethal and agile jumps. We also see the rat bastard Louie, with Moss who scurries away into a cave with a castaway that looks a lot like Alf from Pikmin 3. The caves in this area are a bit more hit or miss in my opinion. Cradle of the Beast would be a challenging cave if it was a tad bit longer, and the ultimate testing range while longer once again proves how bosses who were once tough like the Man at Legs are significantly easier. But hold on, how can that be possible? Keep in mind that the Man at Legs in Pikmin 4 has almost double the health of its Pikmin 2 counterpart. While like most things in this game, Ochi makes his attacks essentially useless. You're actually able to outrun machine gun bullets. Meaning you don't even have to take cover at any point, you can just run circles around him, waiting out his attacks before going in to finish him off. In these caves, you meet with Don Bergman, who helps pinpoint the location of Nell, who is revealed to be in the final area of the game, the primordial thicket. The area's opening cutscene shows off some very unique and frightening looking enemies. It makes you think you're going to be in for a rough time, but then you land, and you learn the lanky grub chucker doesn't have an insta kill and can be interrupted almost indefinitely. The puff stool no longer turns Pikmin aggressive towards the player, instead making them panic and flounder around without ever killing them. And the startle spore will more often than not knock itself over after failing to catch any Pikmin due to Yuzumi passed on Ochi. The caves follow a similar trend, being simple despite them being the final caves in the game. The mud pit is, well, a cave covered in mud. Thing is, the Pikmin you'll be bringing into this place mostly ignore the mud being able to fly over it or freeze it. The subterranean swamp picks up some of the slack, featuring a larger variety of tougher enemies like the armored cannon lava and a sovereign bowl blacks, but while the caves may be getting harder, you yourself are also getting more tools and upgrades that help you counteract and deal with them. After completing these two caves and collecting the rest of the treasures up above, it was time to rescue Nell in the game's final Dandori battle. With Louis bested once again and Nell rescued, we finally learned that to cure Oichi of his leafy tail, we need cells from a non-leafling dog. Thankfully, Louis's voyage logs give us an approximate location of where we can find one. And with that in mind, we travel back to the primordial thicket, where we find the entrance to a cave known as the Cavern for a King. This cave acts as the ultimate challenge and really throws everything it has at the player. Sub-level 3 has 3 burrowing snagrits, who to be fair are a lot easier now that you can charge and stun them before they even fully pop out of the ground. Following on 
apart from this trend, sub-level 5 has 3 Emperor Bull Blacks, which can be pretty tough, especially when they group up after roaring each other awake. Sub-level 2 has another man at war, this time with water, pretty much copying Pikmin 2's variant, but again, Ochi can bloody swim faster than him, so he's about as useless as a waterproof teabag. And then we get to sub-level 10, where we meet with a very, very old friend. Does this egg look familiar? For your own sake, I hope it does. Otherwise, you'll be in for quite a surprise. For those of you drawing a blank, maybe this will jolt your memory. That's right, here we have the Smoky Prog, the abomination that was first encountered all the way back in the original Pikmin. Even though it's far easier to avoid him this time around with Poochie, he's still extremely dangerous being able to instantly kill Pikmin caught in his gloom. Even worse, he now has a few newer abilities like spitting a projectile, which causes gloom waves, and a roar that can send Pikmin into a frenzy, oftentimes causing them to run into its gloom attacks. The Smoky Prog remains one of the most dangerous entities in the Pikmin franchise, and him being the midpoint check of a 20 level cave and straight up kill runs if you're not careful. The next few sublevels are a lot more lax, thankfully, up until sublevel 16, which features not one, but two water rates hunting you down. Or maybe I should say you're the one hunting them down. See, what took me an embarrassingly long time to realize was the fact that I already had purple Pikmin with me, meaning you can damage these two straight up. And with their abysmal health numbers, they are easy enough to take down. The next two sublevels feature another face off against the, the Empress and Emperor Ball Blacks combo, but by this point, you've faced these guys hundreds of times, or at least it feels that way, especially when you can do this. But alas, after much struggle, we finally arrive at the bottom of the cavern, and as you'd expect, we see Louis. But not just Louis, this is the ancient Sirehound. Acting as the final challenge of this game, he doesn't hold back. Much like the Plasm Wraith, this guy can control multiple elemental types. But unlike the Plasm Wraith, he demonstrates these powers through different phases. Certain phases are trickier than others, and if it wasn't for this one glow Pikmin I had on me, I don't believe I would have been able to beat him this time around. I had no yellow Pikmin with me, and it's borderline impossible to jump and avoid all these electrical traps while trying to reach him and flip him over. Thankfully, I had one glow Pikmin with me, who I carefully used to remove the electrical traps. Most of these phases are simple enough, and many of the elemental attacks outside of his gloom phase aren't instant killers either. With regards to his gloom phase though, it's most definitely his most lethal. He not only layers the floor with plenty of gloom bombs, but also has a roar that can send Pikmin into a panic as well. You can probably guess, just based on how the arena's looking, that this attack can single-handedly obliterate a whole army of Pikmin. Honestly though, outside of his electricity and gloom, phases, he's not that bad, and with a few charges each phase, I finally took him down. With the ancient Sirehound defeated and turned back for good, we can take both the gift of friendship that he dropped and Louis for the final time back to our ship. With that, we have officially 100%ed all the mainline story areas, as well as rescued all castaways. I will admit I did not complete every single night expedition for this challenge, mainly because it would not change the overall tally of Pikmin lost anyway. We end up curing Ochi while leaving Moss and the Sirehound to look over the Pikmin while we fly off one last time into the expansive reaches of space. At the end of Pikmin 4, I had lost a total of 297 Pikmin, meaning we can finally answer the age-old question, which Pikmin game is the deadliest? Well, based on my playthroughs and thoughts, I must say the Pikmin 2 is by far the deadliest Pikmin game, and it's not even close. Not only does it pair old school mechanics like free aiming with deadly and unforgiving enemies, but it also limits one of your biggest advantages in this game, that being the ability to restock any Pikmin lost through its cave adventures, thus further increasing the lethality of even the most basic of enemies. I have put a few of my other thoughts as to why certain games are more deadly than others on screen, but for the most part, a lot of it comes down to versatility and the number of plausible solution one is offered in any given situation. Obviously, like all ranking videos, these are subjective and shouldn't be taken as universally adequate. I've done this as a fun little experiment while also adding in my own thoughts and analysis as to why certain games may prove harder than others. Regardless, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'm hoping to see you all in the next one.